Welcome to a series of videos on sizing sawn wood beams. These used to be referred to as solid sawn wood beams, but now just sawn wood beams. The implication is that these are simple beams, rectangular sections cut from trees, as opposed to laminated veneer lumber, or eye joists, or glue lamb beams, which are made from gluing together sawn wood beams. We will follow the procedures in the allowable stress design, ASD. We will not use load and resistance factor design, contrary to what is in the textbook. So for this particular subject matter, you should refer, refer to this video and not to the material in the book. I've done this because the wood industry has shown very little enthusiasm for moving to the LRFD format and in fact they make it difficult to find information and you have to reformat uh, information in order to use this as the basis of your design scheme. So what we're talking about looks something like this. These could be 2x6s, 2x8s, 2x10s, 2x12s. In this case, uh, we see these with people nailing down tongue and groove 3 quarter inch plywood. In the lecture titled uh, Cross-Sectional Properties of Beams, we established certain cross-sectional properties and the relationship between those cross-sectional properties and certain kinds of beam behavior. We're going to review some of that information and extend it somewhat to establish equations or information that will allow us to size sawn lumber beams. You'll recall that we had this piece of foam rubber which we marked with two vertical lines. Uh, those lines, of course, were parallel to each other. This is when the beam was in its relaxed state sitting on the table. Then when we supported the beam, those two straight lines remained straight lines and they kept the same distance from each other along the curved red line in this beam, which we call the neutral axis, but the material shortened on the top, expanded on the bottom, or stretched out on the bottom. Um, as a consequence, what we said was that there was some strain, epsilon, which is fractional deformation, uh, and in any portion that it's occurring in, uh, the amount of strain is in proportion to the distance y, the vertical distance y, away from the so-called neutral axis. We know this has to be the case based on simple geometric arguments. Um, if we understand that the black lines that were parallel to each other before the load are now still straight, but no longer parallel by a simple deduction. The amount of shortening on the top is in proportion to how far away from the neutral axis we look, and the amount of stretching on the bottom is in proportion to how far away from the neutral axis we look. We also have talked about basic properties of materials, and it's been pointed out that over the working range of most common materials, the stress F is proportional to the strain E, or in other words, proportional to the fractional deformation. And the equation that we use to describe that is stress is equal to strain times uppercase E, which is the stiffness of the material. Clearly, the stiffer the material, the more stress we need in order to achieve a given amount of fractional deformation or strain. So, since F is proportional to epsilon and epsilon is proportional to Y, it follows that F is proportional to Y. And we showed diagram diagrammatically what that means. Uh, at the neutral axis along here, we have no tension or compression. The further down we move in the beam, the more intense the tension stress becomes. Uh, the further up from the neutral axis, the more intense the compression stress becomes, and we use the symbol F sub B for the maximum compression or tension stress 
that exert, exist at the cross section. We went through a derivation where we replaced the stress block by an equivalent compressive force, which was centered at the center of action of that stress block. We replaced this tensile stress block with a tension force located at the center of action of the stress block. And we went through a bunch of derivations and came to the conclusion that the moment of those two forces was equal to F sub B times this quantity, which represents something having to do with the cross section. It's one sixth of the base times the height uh, squared, where this dimension across here is the base and this dimension right here is H, or we've drawn that up here. This is B and that's H. And this quantity we call the section modulus. This is the section modulus for the very specific case of a rectangular cross section. If it's any other shape, the section modulus is much more complicated to calculate and doesn't have this simple format. But we came from this to the generalization that the moment is equal to F sub B times the section modulus um, for whatever the cross section might be. S is called the section modulus. We also call it the cross-sectional strength in resisting moment. Now we have this relationship, but if we're going to think like designers, we have to ask ourselves, what are we trying to get at? And typically we've already decided what spans we want. We've ascertained what the loads are. We can figure out what the moment is. We know something about the materials that are available to us and what sorts of stresses can exist in them. And that in turn tells us something about how big the beam needs to be. Or more specifically, it tells us what the section modulus needs to be at least. So we say the section modulus is going to be greater than or equal to the moment divided by uppercase F sub B prime. What this is, is it's the maximum allowable bending stress in that material. And this allowable, by the way, has taken into account um, safety factors. So uh, we no longer are going to have load factors for this material, but we will have safety factors. And when this information is tabulated, it will already have built into it whatever the safety factor is. So there will be tables that will tell us what the maximum allowable bending stress in the material is, and that in turn will allow us to calculate a section modulus. Okay, so we have compression stress in the top, tension stress in the bottom. Typically wood works at least slightly better in compression than it does in tension. If it has any substantial number of notch it, knots, knots do not transfer tension very well. So the tension capacity of the material is drastically reduced by knots. In either case, though, the failure for such a beam typically occurs in the tearing of the fibers on the bottom of the beam. In other words, the failure occurs on the lower half in tension rather than compression on the top. And we expect for a simple span beam under a uniform load that this moment failure is going to occur at the center because that's where the maximum moment occurs. And wherever the maximum moment occurs is where the maximum bending stress along the length of the beam is going to occur. So this is one mode of failure. And it's one thing that we have to design the beam cross section to handle. Now, in addition to this moment, which we derived when we sliced through the original beam and created this free body, we ascertained that there had to be a moment there. And we figured out how to calculate that moment. Um, we also said there had to be some sort of shear force on that face. This is a vertical shear and it's a maximum at the ends. And the reason is that if this free body was just a little teeny free body, there'd be almost no downward force W, but there'd be this very large upward reaction. And so the tendency to shear at that location is 
pretty dramatic because of the size of this force. As we move across the beam, the more of this downward W that we accumulate and the lower the shear force has to be in order to keep this whole thing in equilibrium. When we get to the center of the beam, the downward force W associated with this distributed load little w is just equal to WL over 2, which just equilibrates this RA, and so at that point the shear is zero. So here we have shear very high at the ends. It's equal to WL over 2. It goes through zero in the center and then becomes very negative. And by the way, the difference between positive and negative shear simply has to be, has to do with whether the left free body is tending to move downward relative to the right free body. Um, at this end, this little free body tends to move upward, but if we look at this end right here, this little free body tends to move upward, and that's the only difference between positive and negative shear. The crucial thing is this is really severe shear, that's severe shear, and that's where we expect the failure to occur. So in the case of moment stresses, the worst moment occurs at the center, and that's where the problem is, but we expect the shear failure to be at the end. Now again, I emphasize that this shear force V is on a vertical face. The interesting thing is that when we start loading up a beam, if it's a wood beam, and it's a fairly heavily loaded deep beam, then we don't observe a failure along a shear plane, a vertical shear plane. We actually observe a shear failure along a horizontal plane. So we need to scramble and figure out what's going on here because clearly we've been calculating a vertical shear force and now we're observing experimentally a horizontal failure. So let's try to understand how that might come about. Here we have a beam which I've drawn as pretty deep in its proportions. It's subjected to a uniform load. It has a moment something like that in it. If I create a free body right here and I slice that out and I draw it down here and I apologize the shape has changed. This is drawn a little taller than that was. And I did that just to sort of make this drawing read a little better. But on the left end, the moment is not so high. So we have stresses that look something like this. On this face, the moment is substantially higher. So we see higher bending stresses at that point. These stresses dominate those for this particular free body. Now, we can also slice through this free body and create another one. In other words, we can take the top of this over and put it right there. All these bending stresses that exist here are going to continue to exist on that. And there can be some sort of shear stress on this interface. In fact, if we get the sum of this bending stress and that bending stress, What's left over as a net bending stress is this, which says there's a net force due to the bending stresses to the left on this free body. Uh, that means this shear has to be in the direction in which it's been drawn. So there actually is horizontal shear in this beam. That's not what we started off calculating, but it turns out that calculating the vertical shear is still going to be used to, useful to us for the following reason. We don't know what this shear stress is, but we're going to find an interesting relationship between this shear stress on this horizontal plane and the shear stress on a vertical plane. The way we're going to do it is if we went internal to this beam and we took a tiny, tiny little cube of material that almost is beginning to represent what's happening at some point in the material, because in fact, uh, as long as that little cube or whatever that we extract out is small enough, there's very little change over the course of it. So here's that little cube blown up, and we have a horizontal shear here, and a horizontal shear there, and then we have a vertical shear this way, and a vertical shear that way. And what becomes apparent to us is that um, 
In order to keep this thing from rotating, the horizontal shear and the vertical shear have to be equal to each other. To keep this in equilibrium, that this little cube, that has to be the case. That's a very powerful statement. It says, at absolutely every point in this beam, the vertical shear stress and the horizontal shear stress are equal. So now we can come back here and we can say, well, how does this horizontal shear vary over the depth of this beam? And the answer is, well, we sliced at this point. If we had sliced right up near the top, we'd have almost no net force. And on the lower surface of that, we'd have almost no shear force. The deeper down in we choose to examine, the more of the stress block we have and the higher the shear force is. So the shear force actually starts off zero at the top, goes to some sort of maximum at the neutral axis, and then becomes a maximum in the opposite direction, or becomes zero, excuse me, on the other side. So I'm going to plot what that looks like. The shear stress is essentially zero up at the top. It becomes more extreme. It's a maximum at the neutral axis, and then it diminishes down to zero near the bottom of the beam. Now, the way we know that this thing is sort of a parabola, we know it's a parabola for the following reason. We're initially accumulating the stress block at a pretty high rate, but at a lower and lower rate, and in fact, this is linear. So we're really integrating under this straight line to determine what the net force here is. And that in turn is going to tell us what this shear force has to be. And when we start integrating, um, when we integrate under a straight line, we get a parabola. So uh, that's what this looks like. Now, if we wanted to ask ourselves, what is the maximum? Here's the geometric argument. The average shear stress over this vertical plane due to the vertical shear is going to be whatever that shear force is divided by the area. And I've drawn that here with this rectangle where we've just shown F sub V average as that amount right there. Here is F sub V, F sub V max. Um, which I'm calling a maximum shear stress. And this is something you can demonstrate mathematically. Um, I, don't, I don't think I need to go through it in detail because it's been proven in many texts. But also I think you can just by examination see that that area right there is about equal to that area. And it turns out in this construction, this parabola is one and a half times what the height of this rectangle is. In other words, this is one and a half times that. So I can just say the maximum shear stress, which is what's going to fail this, is one and a half times the average shear stress, which is V over A. Or in the case of this rectangular cross section, it's V over BH. So the maximum shear stress in the material is 1.5 times the shear force at that location in the beam divided by A. Now the interesting thing is, as we said, the horizontal stress, shear stress, and the vertical shear stress are absolutely identical at every point in the beam. This beam is always going to fail by horizontal shear stress though, because that's the plane, those are the planes along which the material is weak. It's hard to shear across the grain. It's really easy to shear parallel to the grain. So, we have this relationship, and now we want to think like a designer again. In the previous case, we said we want to find the section modulus that's necessary to make the beam strong in resisting moment. Now we want to find the cross-sectional area that is necessary to make the beam strong enough in shear. So we say the maximum shear force has got to be excuse me, the maximum shear stress that's in the wood material has got to be less than or equal to the maximum allowable shear stress in the wood material. That follows by definition. The maximum shear stress in the material is 1.5 times V over A. So we say 
that has to be less than that. Or we can rearrange this by taking A up to the other side and this maximum stress down to the bottom uh, and then flipping it so that it reads A is greater than or equal to 1.5 times V over the maximum allowable shear stress in the material. Or in other words, we have this formula. So now we have a formula that allows us to get the required cross-sectional area once we know the shear force and the material properties, which will then tell us what the maximum allowed shear stress in the wood material is. We had one other quantity that we wanted to define, and we did this in this previous lecture on cross-sectional properties of beams. Um, this is called the moment of inertia. And basically, if we take the neutral axis and we mark off a certain distance y, and all this material has essentially a, a distance y from the neutral axis. And we're going to say that ha, that is a small incremental area dA. And now we're this is a cross section we're looking at, by the way, and this is the base. And the height is h, and the neutral axis is at the halfway point between the top and the bottom. Now, we define a quantity called the moment of inertia I as the integral of y squared times dA. In other words, we're integrating over the area of this whole thing, and every little increment dA has a certain distance from the neutral axis, and we're weighting that area by that distance squared. If we integrate from minus h over 2 to h over 2, this y squared dA dA becomes B times a little increment dy. That B is a constant which we can take out from underneath the integral. So then we're left with the integral of y squared dy from minus h over 2 to h over 2. And the integral of y squared is y cubed over 3. And we go through this whole evaluation process and we come out with a moment of inertia is bh cubed over 12. It's a very sensitive function of cross-sectional properties and in particular an extremely sensitive function of h. It's the cube power of h but it's according to sort of the fourth power of the characteristic dimension. In other words if we just doubled all the dimensions uh, we'd, we'd uh, increase the moment of inertia by 2 to the fourth which is a factor of 16. Okay, now I know this is a lot of calculus that I'm throwing at you and I just want, I'm, I'm explaining this more to rationalize things and make you understand they just don't emerge out of nowhere. But I know that you don't want to be responsible for all these proofs. So what I'm doing is trying to give you uh, plausible explanations for all these, where all these things come from so that you can move forward with the confidence that there is some mathematical logic and some physical logic behind it. So in this case I've plotted the load curve with the reactions above the line because technically they're positive. So this is a graph. It's not a load diagram that shows where on the object the forces exist. In other words, this distributed load is on the top of the beam but I've drawn it below the beam because it's negative, because it's downward, and we've taken the convention that upward forces are positive and downward forces are negative. So if this is my load diagram as a mathematical plot, uh, if we integrate this, we get the shear curve. So this is a constant. We get a bump from this localized force. And then we accumulate negative force, so we bump up to a high shear force. Then we accumulate negative force, and then we bump up again and go to zero shear force just before we step off the end of the beam because of this pulse of force that's occurring at the end of the beam. Now, we can actually integrate the shear curve and get moment. And if we integrate the moment curve, we get slope. And if we integrate the slope of the beam, we get the deflection, which we call delta. Now, when we go through all that mathematics, 
for this beam, simply loaded, simple span, uniform load W. When we go through all of that, we say the maximum deflection turns out to be this formula. Now, that's a lot of integration, and we're not going to do all that mathematics in this course, but I want you to understand how that comes about. So now we're going to rearrange this formula because the cross-sectional property that we want to solve for is I. We're actually not so much interested in calculating a delta as prescribing a delta where we say there's some point beyond which we don't want this beam to deflect. And we want to know what moment of inertia is necessary to do that. So this summarizes all the design issues in sizing solid sawn beams in a very, very concise way. Uh, for shear capacity, we require some cross-sectional area, which turns out that has to be greater than or equal to 1.5 times the shear force over the maximum allowable shear force, shear stress in the beam. We need a section modulus that's greater than or equal to the moment, which again has to do with the loads and the spans, and uh, that divided by the maximum allowable bending stress in the material. And finally, we need a moment of inertia which is 5 times W, and here I've lumped, instead of L to the fourth, I put L cubed, and I took out an L, so L cubed times L is L to the fourth, but I took one of those L's out and grouped it with the deflection. And the reason is that our deflection criterion is always expressed as some ratio of delta over L. So we say, for example, for floors to avoid movement being disturbing, um, we're always going to limit the deflection to L over 360. Or in other words, uh, delta equal to L over 360 is L over delta equals to 360. So I just put that number 360 in here to indicate that L is 360 times larger than delta. And then I can work the rest of this formula out. E is the material stiffness. Um, and in the case of wood, we do something slightly different from steel. In the case of steel, we only use W live for the deflection criterion because there's no creep in steel. Wood exhibits some creep over time. And to sort of account for that, we have this 0.5 W dead where we're saying, well, let's put in half the dead load at least as part of our deflection criterion. Typically, the dead load of a wood beam is quite small compared to the live load that it can support. Um, so this is not a large term, but it has to be accounted for. So this allows us to size the cross-sectional area of the section modulus and the moment of inertia. And I'll remind you that this is B, the base, times the height of the cross-section. This, for a rectangular cross-section, is one-sixth of the base times the height squared. And this is one-twelfth of the base times the height cubed. So once I've determined A, S, and I, I can find uh, some appropriate B and H to satisfy all these criteria. By the way, in this kind of construction, we don't usually have a whole lot of choices. B is usually one and a half inches because we're using two bys. We use two bys because that's about as thin as we can make them and still have them be fairly laterally stable. It's also a thickness that allows us to nail into them really easily. Uh, if we had a narrower board, it would be hard to get the nails to always consistently go through the decking into the beam. So B is pretty much set and in the end what we're going to do is we're going to solve for H. The other thing we'll solve for is uh, for standard 2x6, 2x8, 2x10, 2x12 the area and the section modulus and I are already tabulated so in fact we don't even really uh, need to um, 
calculate h, we'll, we'll just go look it up in a table. Okay, so that in brief summary are the design issues and the design factors involved in sizing sawn wood beams. Our, our next video is going to talk about where we find the allowable shear stress and the allowable bending stress and the stiffness of the material. And then in a subsequent video, we're going to go through this actual sizing operation where we account for shear strength, moment strength, and stiffness.